And we're live. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so I am Kyle Stanley. And I'm Simon Chard. And I'm from California. And I'm from London. <laughs> and we are here at Sorona World in Las Vegas. And we just wanted to take the time to have a little banter about maybe the difference of dentistry in the UK and in the US. And um, you know, Simon and I have been friends for a while digitally, remotely. And so it's nice to put a face to a name and... Yeah, nice to finally meet. Yeah, we had a, a nice dinner with uh, my brother Brent and our friend Rob Ritter last night. So we figured it could be a good opportunity to talk about some stuff in front of our friends. Indeed, yeah. Well, I think we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities, even though we live on the other side of the world from each other. Yeah. But, um, we have the same problems and the same... Uh, same passions, I think. That's so, right. Uh, that's the thing that, that binds us. Yeah, one of my business partners calls you the Kyle Stanley of the UK. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said to my wife. I said, "There's a guy. I think I think I've never met him, but I think he's just like me, and he lives in California." <laughs> right. Right. We both have young kids, yeah. pretty wives. That's, indeed. And, indeed. Uh, yeah. So, so I wanted to ask you because in the United States, a lot of people are on the insurance-based system with dentistry, so mm -hmm. their patients are very focused on how much their insurance covers. And right. I know that in a lot of other countries, European countries, dental insurance doesn't exist, or there's general health care. How does yeah. that work in the UK? So, obviously, the, the main thing that guides dentistry in the UK is that we have the National Health Service. Um, and so, the, I don't know how much you know about it, but the National Health Service basically covers a basic standard of care. Okay. You don't have to work with the NHS, you right. can work completely privately, um, but insurance kind of just fills a very small uh, section in, in between that NHS and fully private. So, so in the NHS, do they parts. cover like cleanings or x-rays or anything like uh, that? Uh, yes, x-rays, regular examinations, very basic All crown covered. and bridge, oh, well crown work, not bridge. Right. Um, for example, replacement of a tooth, really the only option that you would have in most clinics would be a, a flipper, a plastic denture. Got it. And that's um, what the NHS would cover. That's what the NHS would cover because it just gets you stable. It so would, would it be like the NHS would cover a flipper, but then insurance may cover a bridge, but then yeah. if you want an implant, then you're going to have to then, pay out That's of exactly it. Yeah, that's okay. exactly it. Yeah, that's, I guess that's similar to the US. A lot of people are based their practices on insurance, right. but like practices like mine, a little more high end, we take insurance that's out of network, mm -hmm. which means that the patient pays up front. Yeah. If their insurance is going to cover anything, it goes it's directly on them. to them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the same as us. Yeah. I think you have to make a decision at some point as to, I, you have to live in the real world, but I, yeah. when, I'm, when I'm making my treatment plan, like Miguel talks about this loads, he's yeah. like, just make the treatment plan that's best for the patient, exactly right. whether or not they can afford it or not. Is, is kind of a, just a perception that they have of the value of what you're right. proposing to them. Right. I think that all you should be doing as a clinician is offering what you think is in their best interest. Yeah, no, I think that's totally true. I know that you do both implants and restorative like me, mm -hmm. right? Yep. How's that been? It's good, yeah. I mean, I, I love implants. Yeah. Like, I thought that I, I, we do, I did a lot of cosmetic bonding in the UK, a lot yeah. of Invisalign, right. sort of minimally invasive stuff. Um, and I thought that's what that's what my real passion was, and I do still really enjoy it. But now, when I have an implant in the diary, I'm just get so excited. excited about it. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's the same way. Even after doing doing it for not not super long, but you know, around ten years. Yeah. Um, I'm still excited. There's something very rewarding about like when it goes in. It's similar to yeah. like when you take a tooth out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? It's that satisfying. Yeah, it's it. like that, um, yeah, you feel like a, <sighs> yeah. a wave. Well, I think I you. think we're the same with regards to our implants in that, like for me, I know you're doing some stuff with Thomas Limbinkus at the yeah, moment, aren't yeah. you? I, I, I look at implants like a, a series of, of techniques and sort of biological principles that you can stack on top of each other to try and increase your success rate. Yes. And I really like that about it. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it fully guided and I'm going to do a custom healing abutment and just sort of add these extra layers yeah. on the top. That's true. It, it can be very a la carte at the beginning. Yeah. You could just do you could do freehand, which I don't recommend, but you could do freehand and close everyone up. Mm. Then let's say you want to start doing guided but you still want to close them because you're nervous yeah. about osteointegration. Then you go to you know immediate provisionalization, and then you 
go to immediate loading or full art. So yeah, yeah, it's nice that you can always refer it. You know, you can always refer it even in the middle of it. And I, yeah. I definitely still have done that myself, where I'm in I'm in something and I say, you know what, I'm gonna close this up and I'm gonna send it to one of my one of my specialists. So I think who, it's who nice. are your mentors? Is, is Sasha Jovanovic one of Sasha your Sasha Jovanovic is definitely my your implant mentor. mentor yeah. yeah, so I was lucky to be introduced to him through Pascal Manier. And Sasha let me kind of ride his coattails for a little bit. And I was you know, looking over him in surgery for yeah. many years. And I'm pretty lucky because he's like a world leader in implants, Absolutely, bone grafting. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And how about you with implants? So with implants, um, I was trained by three of the best UK guys, so uh, Kaya Ferran, um, Zaki Kanan, and Fazila uh, Osborne. Awesome. Um, they, they trained me, um, as well as a, a guy who used to work with Harpal Chana, who uh, does zygomatics. He's a, he's not, cool. He doesn't do a lot of, sort of in, international lecturing, but he's an incredible yeah. surgeon. Um, but yeah, mentors with implants, I think it's like the most important thing. Like yeah, you, you need someone you can call. <laughs> you need someone... Um say like the oh shit factor yeah you know <laughs> something happens you don't know what to do you have someone you can call that's not gonna belittle you yeah and say what are you doing you yeah, know absolutely. say hey this is how we do it. it happens to us all yeah if you've done enough implants you've made the you mistakes. know about failure yeah. yeah I love what you're doing in the sense of bringing together Invisalign cosmetic bonding implants all minimally invasive and I think yeah. that's something that we we have in common too absolutely is as little as possible I, I don't know if you've done, have you done any of the, uh, do you do Invisalign? I don't, but my partner does. I used Matt to do it, it, but yeah, I don't do it anymore. Matt does it. I'm doing yeah. a few of the uh, Invisalign DSD collaboration Great. cases at the moment. Great, super cool. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. Like, the planning you get back is so detailed. Right. Um, I'm finishing a case at the moment and I said all, all the teeth are different colors telling you which ones. It's wicked. And, which, yeah. and like what you're doing perio on, right. like, most of them are sort of, um, I see a lot of Afro-Caribbean girls with big diastomas, like yeah. sometimes the spacing is all over the place and it's really quite complicated and high smile lines everything's on show right. um, and I've got a few cases at the moment and there's perio, pros, implants, ortho and to see it all broken down and sort of planned so extensively I love the guys who yeah. enjoy it they're wicked oh yeah everybody at DST is awesome um, I, it's such a needed thing it's crazy to think that we were doing ortho for so long even traditional ortho too without incorporating the face yeah it was oftentimes okay we're gonna straighten the teeth and hope that it works with a smile or with yeah. the face you know and now it just makes so much sense and I'm, and I'm glad that a line recognized that and recognized that there needs to be a collaboration between yeah. restorative and ortho absolutely it's vital and I mean it's unfortunately in the UK there's still a lot of it I don't know how it is in the states but still a lot of extraction orthodontics going on with kids not as much and but just collapsing of the it's arches still happening yeah and um, I just I hate it. I mean, yeah. we both got young kids, right? Right. If my if my little girl had crowding, there's no way she'd be losing cream. Right. Yeah. Like unless there was quite clearly a sort of a skeletal yeah. um, backing for it. But most of these cases, it's just for efficiency and speed. Right. Whereas Make when, faster. I, when I see a, uh, I have a, a colleague that I work with who was um, trained by Derek Mahoney and Skip, Skip Truett and all of these guys who were, who were all about early inception orthodontics yeah. and. Like age seven, like doing Expanding. expansion. Yeah, love um, that stuff. It's so rare in the UK, but thankfully I was exposed to it really early. Yeah, I think it's a much more American mentality. I think so, and and you bring up a good point. How there's trends in different countries. Yeah, absolutely. And like when I started incorporating plastic surgery into treatment, every American thought I was totally insane. Really? But then I lectured in Brazil and everyone's like, we love this. Really? You know? That's interesting. And I think it's the same way. There's there's different trends like um, I think more in Europe it started on the implant side doing immediate placement on molars with an immediate custom healing abutment. Mm -hmm. And in the US people weren't really doing that. And yeah. some of our friends that we're on a WhatsApp group with would show me this stuff and I'd be like, that's amazing. And they've been doing it for years. Yeah. And people still had never heard about it. Absolutely. I mean, I was just in a, in a talk this morning, and um, uh, what's the gentleman's name? The guy I was standing with earlier, uh, Batley. Oh know? yeah, Batley. Batley. Yeah. Awesome really, guy. really wicked. From wicked USC. Talk. From the school from that USC. I went to. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. So he was. A, he did an, uh, an awesome lecture. He did the whole lecture on uh, immediate implants, 
and he didn't talk about. He said he he showed all these cases, no soft tissue grafting at all. Yeah. Um, and in the in the UK and, and and I think in Europe, it's all about soft tissue grafting. Right. Right? Everyone's doing simultaneous CT graft at right. the time of placement, yeah. um, dual zone therapy, and all of that sort of stuff. And um, it's just really interesting to see different concepts. But he was showing 10, 15 year cases <laughs> just with GBR, and yeah. I'm like, wow, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and he was saying there's a lot. I think there's a lot more allograft usage over here, whereas there's a lot more xenograft usage in Europe. Right. In, yeah. In, in and what's Europe. interesting with me is because I was trained by European with Sasha, mm -hmm. and I was always xenograft. Based. Really? Yeah. And still are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. insane, isn't it? Yeah. And it's kind of an really interesting thing about me is that none of my mentors are really American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I have Pascal who's from Switzerland, yeah. Sasha who's from Croatia but grew up in the Netherlands, and then Christian who's yeah. from Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I practice in the US, so I don't know what's wrong. That's probably why we're on the same page with regards yeah, to our mentality, maybe. right? Yeah, 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 I think so. I would like to think I'm a little bit European at heart. I'd like to think that. That makes me sound a little more interesting than being uh, just from California. Oh, mate, it's cool to be from California. You know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not bad. We have similar weather like where we're at now. You can see the beautiful palm trees, blue yeah. skies in Las Vegas. Do you have any questions for me about like um, where we, you know, practicing in LA or? Yeah, I mean, it must be high stress, right? I mean, you do, you work with a lot of celebrities. For sure, um, yeah. And I, I've done my fair of work with celebrities and it, it brings a different angle to the situation, right? right? I mean, a high lip line case in a young person is difficult at the best of times. Right. But and then when they're, they're on national on press, yeah. it's, um, it brings the level up a bit. So I mean, how do you, do you find that easy to cope with? Has it always just been part of the course for you? I found it easy to talk to them, but I was definitely nervous, especially working on my first celebrities, was very, very nervous about it. As you, know, you may have known, some of my followers have known that I went through kind of a dark period in dentistry where I, I, I wanted to quit dentistry. But I think what I learned is how to really be honest with the patients. When I first started getting out of school, it was like, Oh yeah, like implants are great, you know, veneers are the best, like everything we do is just so amazing. And what I realized is just to and I felt that. I I believed, believed that. Yeah. yeah, but I think what it was is I hadn't had my failures yet. Yeah. And then you have your first failures and it's like it hits you like a ton of bricks. Yeah, you feel so <laughs> bad because I think like I went to school for all this long. You know, I'm traveling around teaching other people how to do stuff. Do yeah. I not know what I'm doing? Yeah. And so going through that dark period, I think definitely brought me back to reality and brought me back to, brought my ego down to where I'm very honest with people, talk to them about failures. Yeah. You know, if I hadn't had any failures in that specific one, I'll tell them, but I usually say, you may be the first one. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's I, probably made you a lot stronger, right? Yes, for sure. Going through that has definitely made me stronger, brought my ego down and allowed me to I think be a little more relaxed at times and go over consent forms with patients and know them know getting them knowing what they're getting into yeah and knowing that we're dealing with so many multifactorial things we're dealing with my skill skills we're dealing with the patient whatever they do at home we're dealing with biology we're dealing with physics yeah and everything and those, has those to come together things we know about there's a lot of, I'm there's sure other stuff we don't, know. we don't know about yeah that. so when the patient understands that what we're doing is research-based, it's been tested, we I can do the best possible treatment. Yeah. They which can you, still which screw you will it up. do. <laughs> they can still screw it up. Yeah, exactly. And maybe I can do the best thing, they can do everything, but biology doesn't want to be our friend that day. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think it just brings it down to reality. Yeah, and I think you I think you've hit the nail on the head that for me, I, I, the more transparent I can be yeah. um, with my patients, the, the happier it makes me feel inside. Because I think the worst thing that you can feel is that, or the worst thing a patient can feel is that you've does the word hoodwinked, is that, is that an international word? Uh, yes, really. yeah, we know that you've word. Like hoodwinked, yeah, you've right. been like hoodwinked, they, that you've hoodwinked the patient into something they didn't fully understand what they were getting into. Right. Right. And I think the more transparent you can be, the better your communication skills. For sure. People appreciate the better you can be, the better you are as a clinician. I you know, I've had cases where a treatment plan the patient, I've got everything ready, we've booked them, they've even paid sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I I have a bad feeling about it. Mm -hmm. And I call the patient, talk to them, and say, you know what, I'm not really confident in this. I'd rather have you see him or her, or at least get another opinion. Yeah. And you know, I I'm so nervous to make those calls. Yeah, it's I very think, difficult. I think they're gonna be mad at me. Like, oh you wasted my time. Usually they're like 
thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks yeah. for the call. I really appreciate the honesty. That's super brave of you, and I think that's so important. But that's that's a really tough call to make. They're hard calls to make. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And about the way in which you phrase that conversation is, it's quite difficult for your ego as well, right? right. I mean, we're both like we both put ourselves out there as, yeah. well, we like to think that we're top end clinicians right. because we are so passionate about what we do, but. Yeah. I think even no matter still how human. Hey, that's, that's the key. Is. That's the key. Yeah, and I think that once you get to that level in your career when you realize I may be good at a lot of things, I'm still human. Yeah. I can still make mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so, something that we bonded over very early was that we both have struggled with anxiety. Right. And I think it would be uh, rem- it would be remiss of us not to discuss that now, but yeah. now that we're together at right. last, <laughs> um, because I think it's such an important thing, like. There's a, I, I've, I've always struggled with it since I've been a dentist, to be honest. And I yeah. don't know if it's dentistry, it's been caused by dentistry or it's something that I've always had. I but, think it is. <laughs> because um, I, didn't, I didn't have it before dentistry. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's also maybe our, I don't know, I think it's, it's prolific within our profession and completely yeah. under-talked about. Yeah. But I think also, depending on your personality type, if, you're, if, you, if you don't care about what you're doing, yeah, and it makes it very easy not to be as anxious. Yeah, you know, the first, it's interesting that you say that. The first time that I started talking to people about this and lecturing about it, I had a lot of people tell me, you know, it's great that you have anxiety because that means that you really care. Yeah. And it made me feel a lot better because it's like, I do care. You yeah. know, if, if a patient's going through something and during the process they are in pain, I don't want them to be in pain. Yeah. Or if, something happens and they're uncomfortable or you know I made it hard for them to be with their family or take off work or whatever it is or yeah. fails yeah it I feel it yeah absolutely you know? and I think that that maybe is a good thing to have that because like you said if you didn't care about it yeah. you'd just be you know doing whatever and whether it works or not it doesn't matter yeah absolutely and I guess that's what drives us to be exceptional clinicians true so it's a double-edged sword right? yeah. you can't have one without the other <laughs> that's true yeah that's definitely true but I mean I, there's a there's been a few cases in the UK that I've heard about really high profile clinicians who have actually taken their own lives I think yep. it's, it's probably it's US. probably the most important thing that we can talk about especially as young clinicians with the impact of the negative impact of social media on right. mental health right I always I mean everyone talks about like dental porn yeah. and how like you see all these amazing cases internationally online you're flicking through your feed and i obviously follow loads of dentists and all you see is just smashing case smashing case and no blood yeah you know can't see the margin they're on doing anything. surgery and the patient's not are bleeding. those veneers <laughs> all those natural teeth it's yeah. like it's so good and you're you naturally compare yourself against everyone's best cases and right what you have to realize is that people are it uh, the thing the best way you can describe social media is that it normalizes the exceptional and so um, true. and that can make you feel very negative about your own position, where you live, where you holiday, if you right. holiday, yeah. what work you do, how good your veneers are, how good your implant work is. Right. Yeah, um, I always say that on social media, you're seeing people's highlight reel. Yeah. You know, you're seeing their best cases. Yeah, you're absolutely. not seeing the one that failed or the one that the patient wanted their money back on or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. That's why I think that the, there seems to be a rise at the moment about high, high end clinicians talking about their failures. I think there's even a failures in implant conference, right? Oh, there is? I already uh, know that. I think so. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure Joseph Kahn will be there. I think Joseph Kahn was one of the first people that I saw that was really showing, look at what I did in 2005. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. published on this. Yeah, I thought yeah. I was the best clinician ever. 10 years later, I got a I saw a, that recently on, a message. on Vertical Augmentation. He was yes. talking about it, wasn't he? Yeah. 10 years later, I got a message from the patient, you know, on LinkedIn, she wanted to come see me and the implant's falling out. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really cool to see that and Absolutely. see it from people that we look up to, you yeah. know, seeing it from, from the top down. And I think that's where it should happen. It has to. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you just think that you're a bad clinician. Of course. When you see the best showing those failures, then it's, um, it's very refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. I think that next what we need to do, and it's happening a little bit because we've talked about it, is get some of the people that are promoting conferences to invite people to talk about mental health absolutely and I've had I always when people invite me to speak I say they say what are your topics and I give them my topics and mental health is always one of them and usually they're like eh, I don't know if we really want to talk about that yeah but recently I may actually be and it's not it's not fully ready yet but I may be lecturing in uh, in Europe about that absolutely and I think that we need to have more young people talk about it 
we need to have, well, everybody really, we need to get rid of the stigma yeah. of anxiety or depression or panic disorder because everybody goes through hard times, whether you're a dentist or not, but yeah. especially when you're a dentist. And I think having a colleague talk, to talk to about it makes total sense than having a random person. Absolutely. Even a family member, even a spouse. Because they may not understand. They may not know what we go through. I mean, certainly, I, so I've, I've, I've posted about this probably not as much as you, to my detriment probably, um, but any time that I put a post up, either helping people manage their own anxiety or talking about my own anxiety, the amount of engagement and DMs Same, I like, get yeah. from other dentists, and dentists who, I, who I've known for years, yep. who I view as incredible clinicians, right. will message me saying that they've had exactly the same problem, and it's, it's yep. fascinating. I think the more that can be discussed, the, I mean, if it saves one life, then it's been exactly. uh, completely worth it. So yeah. you'll probably push me to start speaking about this I hope so. at conferences more, yeah. because I think, um, it, as you say, it needs to be uh, discussed at that level. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. Cool. Anything else? Uh, I think we've covered all discover? the bases there. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, cheers from Las Vegas, from Serona World. And for my followers, if you're not following Simon, please follow him, Dr. Simon Chard. You'll find him. And uh, same here, guys. Carl Stanley, incredible clinician. And uh, now a, a good real life friend. That's as right. opposed to a social media That's friend. That's right. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool, All right, man. guys. Cheers. See ya. Nice. Yeah, that's great.